And intuition is something that we all have. It's a deep knowing within about how to act, where to go, what to do. And it's something that we don't need to learn, right? We don't need to learn. We rather need to remember mm. because we are all deeply intuitive. We are all psychic. We're all telepathic. And we've been led to believe that we're not. And we've been fed this idea that anyone that embodies that is kind of a hippie or a bit mystical or special. And those notions limit the understanding of what it truly means to be a human being. Hi, Rhiannon. Thank you for coming on the show today. It's so good to have you. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, Jimmy. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, for sure. Um, so I want to get started by um, talking about your story, right? I know that um, you recently just wrote The Keepers of the Light Codes, and I can't wait to get into all of that. But I want to hear more about how you became a healer, intuitive channel, and energy worker. Mm, sure. Um, so I guess I'm one of the very lucky people that started to explore doing what they loved from a really young age. Um, so when I first left school, I just had about a year of complete confusion where I wanted to be an accountant. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I pretty quickly after that started to study remedial massage and different bodywork modalities. But as I was doing that, I, you know, I had a very limited consciousness and a very limited understanding of spirituality. So what I was learning was... Um, very in the physical, you know, how to do sports massage and how to pe help people with injuries. And the studies in the physical then translated into like a really physical yoga practice and um, <laughs> wanting to be really, really amazing at yoga. And then I did a yoga teacher training. But then as I, as I, as I got older, I started to meditate more. And um, in that meditation, I started to know myself better I guess I started to connect to my heart and my truth and, and what I was wanting and then with that my my actual life started to change so from about the age of 24 I started to see so much that was really limiting and restricting in my life like my relationship as much as that man was my friend I felt trapped and my mortgage and my job I just felt trapped and through my meditation, I kept asking for help. I didn't know I was praying, but I guess I was. I was like, there must be a better way. There must, this can't be life. And the more I was asking for that help, the more I was just being shown different ways to go. And um, so the older I got, the more I started to dabble and play with like the mystical realms. I got, you know, oracle cards and tarot cards and I was finding that when I was doing the tarot, the more I meditated, the more clear my mind got from doing the tarot, I was able to get the messages of what each card meant without reading the book. I was able to like tune into this, this higher, this higher thought form, my higher self and, and find out what the cards meant. So from doing that to myself, I started to do that for my friends and my family. And then I started to do it for my clients as well. Um, so it was like, it's, it's two paths that have evolved alongside one another. The first is my, my body work, which, which evolved into becoming energy work. The more I realized that the energy was what could fix everything, whereas the physical could only fix the physical, I guess, in a way. And then alongside that journey, diving into meditation and diving into listening to that higher thought form. And then I suppose about four years ago, maybe nearly five years ago, I was I received like a really intense initiation where I had to dive all in to listening to that voice. Like I'd been trusting and listening to that voice with tarot, with my clients. But like four and a half years ago, I went to Bali with my mom and I had a, a boyfriend at the time. And I went with my mom to do a juice fast and we did like a yoga retreat juice fast. And um, gosh, I met this man and he was everything that I had ever wanted in a man that I didn't think existed. Like, you know, he was able to have these really profound conversations with me, but he was 
um, really grounded and really into yoga and all these things. And we just hung out all week, my mom, Scott, and, and me. And then after a couple of days, I was, I started to pray. I was asking spirit, like, am I meant to be with this man? Because you need to tell me, like, you need to tell me because my, <laughs> my partner then came to meet us in Bali with my mom and he brought a ring. He'd asked my dad if he could propose. And I just spent three days with this man who seemed like the reflection of my perfect partner. And all I did is I just locked myself in a room and I just meditated. I prayed all day and I was trying to connect to that voice, that same voice I'd heard in my tarot, that same voice that I'd heard in my sessions. I was like, tell me what to do. And I chanted the Ganesha mantra, which is the remover of obstacles, because mm. I just wanted there to be no mistake because I wasn't unhappy in my life. That's the crazy thing. It's easy to make change when you're unhappy, but I was really happy. Like, and but something was telling me that this is your moment to jump and do life differently. And I just meditated. I, I asked for help. I asked for help. And every time I asked, the answer was like, leave, leave. I don't want to say his name. Leave him. Be with, be with Scott. And I did it. And I, I sent my boyfriend at the time. I sent him home and it was very painful. It was very sad because it mm. was like saying goodbye to a friend. But I just had to trust that voice. And yeah, and then I, I didn't love Scott, obviously, because I'd only known him for a few days, but then we spent so much time together that the love came really instantly. Mm. And then five weeks later, I was pregnant, you know, so we've only been together four and a half years. We're married, we've got a three and a half year old and a one and a half year old. And, um, and like, he's just my soulmate, you know, he's my soulmate. And my point is here that in that moment, I was initiated that this voice, this, this deep connection that I have to my, my inner voice, it's not just for, it's not just for tower. It's not just for having fun. Like this is the guiding light that is going to keep you on your highest path. Mm. And then from that moment where I, I, I listened and I acted in a major life decision, my life is changing really, really quickly and evolving really quickly because I keep doing it over and over. And yeah, that's where I am now is my, my life is dedicated to my ability to listen. And, and I say my ability, ability, we all have this ability, but the way that I listen and connect to my guides and that, that fuels my entire work life, my personal life and everything. And that's where I am now. Mm. Wow. That is such a powerful story. Like, I feel like I had like goosebumps listening to it because one of the topics that I'm super passionate about on my podcast is talking about intuition and, and being able to listen to that higher voice, um, and tapping into that. And, you know, I've tried different ways to explain what intuition is and how it works, but I still have so much to learn. Um, and it seems like the journey that you've been on so far, you've really strengthened your intuition. So I have so many Mm -hmm. follow-up questions to your story, but the first thing I want to ask, because it sounds like what you're talking about is really Mm -hmm. honing in on that honing into that intuition, right? So Mm -hmm. for people who are listening, how would you describe what intuition is? Mm. So intuition is this word that we're all starting to hear about and it's still on the fringes. Like, do we have it? Don't we have it? But to me, it's like the sense that we was never explained to us as children. And just as we can see and hear and feel and smell and taste, we know, our bodies know, we know, we are deeply guided beings. You know, we are not separate from one another. We are not separate from source. And the when we realize how connected we are to source or God and each other and our highest aspect, then life is easy. I'm mm. not saying it's without obstacles or without challenges, but we can navigate these challenges and obstacles with a, a great sense of knowing that these obstacles actually serve us. Mm. And intuition is something that we all have. It's a deep knowing within about how to act, where to go, what to do. 
And it's something that we don't need to learn, right? We don't need to learn. We rather need to remember Mm. because we are all deeply intuitive. We are all psychic. We're all telepathic. And we've been led to believe that we're not. And we've been fed this idea that anyone that embodies that is kind of a hippie or a bit mystical or special. And those notions limit the understanding of what it truly means to be a human being. Mm. And what it truly means to be a human being is that we do have these, these extra set of senses that are available to us on demand at any time with no exceptions. Mm. There's something in your book. I, I know that we're, I want to talk more about the book that you recently wrote a little bit later, but there's something you wrote in your book, Keepers of the Light Code, that really, really resonated with me um, in the lessons chapter, The Gateway to God. And you said the gateway to God is through the heart. Mm. Are you talking about intuition there as well? Yeah, it's all one and the same. It's all Mm. one and the same. So... When I first started meditating and connecting, I I thought that everything that I was connecting with existed outside of myself, you know? Mm. So if I closed my eyes and I, I imagined the universe, I would imagine the sky above with the stars and what is it that exists up there? So up there implies that it's out of me, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. But the truth is that When we sit, if we allow ourselves to feel and sense the internal space within the rib cage, like the upper rib cage, the chest, if you see the internal space, it will be like a black cavernous void, like a cave, right? Mm -hmm. A black cave within your chest. If you sit with that black cave for long enough, you'll see that that black, that blackness is the expansiveness of infinity. And Mm -hmm. that exists within you. And the expansiveness of infinity holds everything, all of time, all of space, all of existence. And that exists within the cavity within your chest. And if all of existence lives within your chest, then the creator himself or itself lives within you as well. Mm. The energy that binds and unifies and unites all of existence lives within the chest, lives within the heart. And once you can understand that, that as a gateway, that as a portal, that space within you, then you can be connected to anyone, anything, and most importantly, source, source itself, that frequency of creation itself within you at any time. Mm. So do we strengthen our intuition through meditation and prayer? Yeah, I feel that this is two steps. first of all we strengthen our intuition by removing that which questions and that which doubts Mm. and that is a multi that is a multitude of things firstly it's the mind it's that lower mind that doesn't stop that just keeps going and keeps going so when we are able able to quiet that mind or, or control that mind train it like a puppy then there's more space to come into that heart and feel. The other thing that we need to to train is the the influence of the external chatter. Mm. We're being fed so many many, um, messages, so much information that it's hard to know what is right and what is wrong, what is truth and what is false. Mm. But when you remove as much of that chatter as you can, then you get better at hearing the voice within. And I I mean, like, you know, there's a lot of chatter there, like get rid of your TV, (laughs) don't have one, Uh, really have conscious awareness as you move through social media or just ditch it for a while. These are all external sources of information that make it difficult to understand what is your own internal source of information. So once you train and and you purify your mind space, your internal space by purifying your thoughts and their stimulation then the second part is yeah to come into connection with the heart connection with the heart as a portal to infinity so that way I spoke about before Mm -hmm. connection to the heart as that internal space and then listening 
we go there sometimes with so much expectation. People want when they're connecting to their intuition to see like a TV screen appear with a story of their future or like a booming voice of God. It's not going to come like that. Mm. It's going to come when you turn down the stimulation, come into your heart and just watch and witness and feel and whatever is there, even if it feels like absolute crumbs of information that doesn't feel supportive or doesn't explain anything, maybe you connect to your heart and something says, it's okay, right? Rather than that not being enough, that message, can you take that message of it's okay and hold it with so much love and gratitude, like it has absolutely transformed your life and act on that, act on that message, it's okay. So soften your body, it's okay. Let go of the worry. It's okay, you know. And then when you listen and you trust and you act, the message get the messages get more profound, more detailed, more obvious. So first there is quietening, then there is going into the space of the heart, then there is listening, trusting, and acting. Mm. Speaking of trust, because that's a big one, right? I think a lot of people get stuck in really strengthening their intuition or listening to their intuition because a lot of times it's hard to trust because sometimes you're being guided to do something that seems like it might blow up your life or how are you sure it's going to work in your case Mm. for example you know like you said when your ex-boyfriend came to Bali at the time you were happy there wasn't necessarily anything wrong in your life Mm. and you know, you met this other person that really connected with you on a deeper level, but even still, it wasn't an easy decision. So how did you trust the guidance from your spirit guides saying basically, hey, you should go this other way. You should go, you should lean into the direction um, with the other person that you just met versus someone that you had been with for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. So to make a decision to change when life is good is the ultimate test. Mm. It's the ultimate test. And that's very rarely the first test. Usually we get opportunities to trust our intuition when life isn't pleasing anyway. Mm. Right. So that wasn't the first time. That was the first time I acted on the channeled voice, Mm. but I was acting on, um, discomfort in my body a long time prior to that Mm. so at the start when you're listening to your intuition it's going to come quite differently so let's say you you you're not channeling you don't have that internal voice your intuition's still there for you but it's going to be in a more obvious way Mm. because maybe you're a little more numb so you need to have a more intense experience to know Mm. something needs to change so let's say um like Maybe when I was 24, I had another relationship (laughs) Mm. and um, I wasn't happy then, you know, I was, I was depressed and my job felt really restricting and I was unhappy and I was, I was numb to my life. I was um, just going out and partying as much as I can to find anything that felt like freedom. Mm -hmm. And then I had another, uh, another kind of life present itself to me like a different option a different a fork in the road type thing and that was again another relationship and it was also a new job and the question for myself was then it was really scary to make that change but I asked myself what's more scary the thought of being in this life forever Mm. or the thought of making the change and at that point the more painful situation was staying Mm. So most people don't make decisions because the fear of the unknown is too great. But if they got really real with themselves and asked, what about the pain of being where I am forever? Mm-hmm. And if the, pe- if the thought of staying doing exactly what you're doing now forever is, is quite intense, you know you've got to make change. Mm-hmm. So at the start, our intuition guides us in this way that's really easy to act. You feel discomfort in your body. You're given an opportunity. Yes, it's scary, but not as scary as staying still. Mm. And then you jump. And next time it happens, you're at a fork in the road. But the pain, the discomfort in your body is not quite as severe. Like life's not that bad. It's okay. But this opportunity is really exciting. And what Mm. will I do if I don't? Mm. 
Mm. And then you jump. And then the more you trust, the more you listen and the more you go for it, then all of a sudden there might not be any discomfort in your body when you're making a decision, but just a whisper that says, try this, Mm. try this. And you still act because you've had that training in trust. Because every time you acted in the past, when you were given an opportunity to jump, life expanded, life got better. Mm. So then all of a sudden you're listening to the whisper in your voice and you can trust it because all the other times you trusted those decisions, life got better. Mm. Yeah. To start with, yeah, I don't think people get initiated or I don't know any stories where people have had to listen to their intuition for the first time ever where life was really great. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty like advanced initiation, I think, into trusting intuition. And we usually build up to that. So speaking of initiation, what does that mean exactly? Um, Because you talk Mm -hmm. about you were initiated on that trip. What is the essence of an initiation? Mm. So... I believe in our life, we all have this opportunity to tap into our highest and brightest path, our highest and brightest timeline or potential. Mm -hmm. But in order to fulfill that and in order to be the person that lives that life, who are like, you know, who do we need to become? What do we need to let go of? What do we need to call in? And I believe that if we are connected to a vision of the future, even if that vision for the future is very light, very faint, not very detailed, then spirit kind of picks up on that. Whether spirit plants that seed, that idea, and then we tune into it or vice versa, who knows? (laughs) But spirit picks up that that's the path that you're starting to tune into. And you'll start to be um, initiated a series of times to help you to become the person you need to be to live that life. Mm -hmm. So these initiations can be letting go of old wounds, letting go of old ideas, letting go of our ancestral patterning and conditioning, uh, letting go of fears and doubts, or stepping up into more confidence, stepping up into more power, into more authenticity, into more potency, alignment to purpose. And these things aren't going to just happen overnight. We're we're initiated, right? So that one, for me, when I, I... Met, the, met Scott in Bali and had to leave my ex. That was my initiation in, into deep trust in the magic of life, mm. deep trust in, in my intuition and what happens if I surrender. And from that, I, was, I, I got that piece so strongly. And now, now if you think about it, this is my work. Mm. This is my, my writings. It's like I needed that initiation to become who I am now in my, in my entire life. Mm. And sometimes we're initiated in ways that are really painful, you know, like we have to feel all the pain of the little girl who was not good enough. And Mm. and it's these initiations where we dive into that pain and that suffering, where we transmute and turn that pain into our worth and our love. Like this is a beautiful moment because we're becoming more of who we need to be to live our highest and brightest truth. Mm. So if I understand correctly, initiations are um, moments in time that you experience that kind of take you to the next level towards your higher self, towards your highest purpose. Is that correct? Beautiful. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, This is just so um, powerful. I'm like eating up every single word that's coming out of your mouth because this is just such a beautiful way to explain it. But one thing um, I just thought about, and I think why intuition sometimes might feel abstract to people is because, you know, are we talking about God? Are we talking about angels? Are we talking about spirit guides? So I want to know when you talk about Mm -hmm tapping into that higher source what does that higher source look like to you Mm, what does it represent I guess that's mm, that's the best way to say it so my understanding of that higher source changes and evolves as I change and evolve Mm. and it's going to be different for everybody but when we understand that when you make love with someone 
to make love to someone and a baby is conceived and Mm. there's nothing left to do. There's nothing left to do. Something miraculously turns two cells into life, Mm. into a baby that cries with its own unique personality, with, you know, wounds like my baby from such a young age, the oldest, she was scared of vacuums, you know, Mm. And and the younger one wasn't. Like, where does that come from? She's come into the world with that, like, and um, I didn't do anything to create this baby. What created that life? Mm -hmm. What turned all those cells and and multiplied and and shaped perfect, perfect life, you know? Mm -hmm. What is that force? What is that divine power that every, um, that, you know, every single day sees the sun come up and the sun go down, that makes the, the waves, the tides come up and retreat? that makes the butterfly, the caterpillar, um, go into hibernation for the perfect amount of time to become a butterfly. Mm. What is that intelligence that is so divine and so perfect? Um, There is a frequency there of divine perfection, Mm. right? And that is the tapestry, the orchestration that is all of life. And that's what I mean by source. Mm. Because in that, ev- everything thrives. If you think about that, all of life is so perfect. All of life thrives. So when we tap into that as an energy, we thrive. Mm. We become our most full and expansive expression of ourself. So <clears throat> with that being said, I do believe that within, within all of existence, within all of energetic creation, there is an infinite number of frequencies Mm. the exact frequency of the butterfly flying, the exact frequency that is the sun rising. You can feel how, you know, yes, this is all creation, but each of those things has a own unique energy, right? An Mm. own unique energy. And within all of creation, there are higher frequencies and there are lower frequencies. Um, You know, a lower frequency could be something, a hateful act, um, you know, a hateful act or a really self-destructive act, you can feel that that is a frequency in itself. Yes, it's part of all of creation, but it's a lower frequency. Mm. And when we're talking about spirit guides, what we're talking about is attuning to the highest possible frequencies for whatever it is that you need in any given moment. And these frequencies are energies, but they hold manifested Uh, manifested reality so just as the butterfly flying that is an energy Mm. but that holds them the the physical manifested form of a butterfly flying right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's like I believe that with our spirit guides there are um, there are an infinite number of energies and we can tap into the energy by focusing on the 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 manifested form the manifested Mm. energetic form so this is different for everybody depending on where they are in their path or, or what their experiences are. But when you focus on, on Jesus as a holy master and you see the image of Jesus in your, in your mind's eye, but really what is it that you're connecting to? You're connecting to um, an energy, a vibration that is Christ consciousness. Mm-hmm. Or you connect to um, the, the beings of light, the galactic beings of light, right? And you, you connect and you might see a face or a name or a shape, but really what is it you're connecting to? You're connecting to the, maybe the vibration of a loving civilization, mm. of, of living, of, of a life that anchors heaven on earth, you know? Mm-hmm. So when I'm tuning into my spirit guides, <clears throat> I know first and foremost that I have an army, as we all do. Mm-hmm. I never just attune to one or another. Sometimes. I do, but it's very, very rare. But what I always do is I I call in my highest and brightest guides Mm. because depending on where I am at any given moment, that's going to change. And I don't want to limit myself by only attuning to one frequency. Mm -hmm. I call in my highest and brightest guides. And sometimes I have moments where these unique frequencies, these unique energies reveal themselves as an ancestor reveal themselves as an angel. But what I know is it's a team of light beings or rather it is a frequency of collective light consciousness. Mm. So that to me is what spirit guides are. But at the end of the day, 
if we can connect to source as an energy, source as a frequency, that divine perfection that is all of creation, that to me is the highest energy that you could possibly attune to when you're asking for your intuitive guidance. Mm. That was beautifully said. Absolutely spot on. Um, I think that for a lot of people, I I personally don't find this stuff abstract, um, Mm. but for a lot of people, I I don't want to say the masses because I don't know if that's accurate. um, I think being able to connect to, like you said, that vibration, that energy. Um, I do think that everything has like a blueprint of how they're supposed to operate in this world. Um, And I think for a lot of people, they think that those type of practices or tuning into those vibrations kind of takes away from being attuned to God. But I like what you just said about, you know, for people, for example, who believe in Jesus Christ, um, to being able to picture Jesus or tap into that frequency of goodness that they see in Jesus or feel about Jesus, I think is a great way of letting people who have certain religious beliefs kind of see these other practices as something that could be added to their spiritual life and doesn't have to be separate from God or doesn't have to be too woo woo um, because it's mm. all it all works together and that's how I feel in my opinion anyway so I think how you yeah. just broke it down makes a lot of sense yeah thank you and I feel yeah like I I love Jesus and I connect to Jesus so deeply as a holy master mm. but I also connect and feel, you know, the galactic beings. I feel um, Buddha and it doesn't matter what religion. Yeah. It comes from in religion. There is a notion of separation Mm. because you take one vibration and you lock it in and you make that the only truth. Yeah. But if you expand outwards and come back to create a consciousness and the infinite, the infinite frequencies, then there are an infinite number of truths and they can all be true. You know, that's why I do love religion as well. Like I love um, one of my most powerful healing experiences was this like, like deeply, deeply Christian women. And that's quite foreign to me in Australia. Like Australia doesn't have much faith really. Mm. There's a lot of spirituality emerging, but there's not really a deep, following of Christianity like over in the States I don't think Mm. but I I went for a massage with um, this beautiful woman and she was so Christian that it was almost confronting to me like it was it was like wow I've never met someone who speaks like this but Mm. her energy was divine and she gave me a massage and then at the end she held my head and she sang like she was channeling angels she was just sung Mm. and she her heart just was so pure and just tears were just rolling. And I was like, wow, how can the love that she holds and her devotion to spirit be anything less than perfect, you know? Mm, mm. But that's true in so many religions. And it's only when someone holds the, the, the dogma that is separation within the religion that it becomes unpure. Yes, I absolutely agree. I've always said this, and I think I've always known this intuitively ever since I was young. And I just feel like there are multiple ways to God. Like you said, when we were just talking about intuition and you said, you know, for every person, it's going to be different, the energy or frequency they decide to tap into or what represents that frequency, I should say. Um, So I totally agree with you. Um, that it really doesn't matter what religion. I do think there are multiple ways to God, but it's when you separate, when you tap into the separation based on a specific dogma, that's what kind of makes it un, um, unpure. And I think a lot of people tend to do that. Why do you think though people um, hold on to specific dogmas so fervently? They're so scared to let it go. They feel like this is the only way to God. It's this way or you're doomed to internal damnation. Why do you think people tend Mm. to do that? Yeah, I've never pondered that before. Um, I'm, 
Well, first and foremost, if they have authentically found God in a moment via the church, then that in that experience, that is the path to God, right? In their mm-hmm. experience, that is the path to God. But I feel that anyone that truly meets God in any moment, that notion would dissolve then and there mm-hmm. because they would feel the all expansive nature of reality, right? So I feel that when people are, are really holding on to the dogma of a certain religion or even a certain spiritual practice, it's because they haven't truly met a moment in time where they felt the true expansive nature of existence, Mm. where we are all connected, where we are all one. I don't believe that in order to hold on to one dogma, I don't believe you could have felt that because all dogma and notions of separation dissolve in that moment. So I think what is driving the fixation on one thing or one, one way of doing is fear. Fear that if I let this go, then I'll never find God. Mm. Or fear that if I let this go, I'll end up in hell or end up somewhere that, you know, isn't where I want to be. But I just feel like the journey into the heart then just dissolves all of this. Mm. Because like I spoke about at the beginning, that internal, that internal universe, the internal cosmos, right, where you feel the infinite nature of life and all exists within your heart, then you realize that the church is your body. You realize that the religion is life. And then how can you judge or hold on to a dogma when you've had that experience? Mm. Mm. That's powerful. So I want to talk about Keepers of the Light Code. Um, First of all, I just want to say that that name is absolutely amazing. I just think about superheroes when I think about that, but like light beings or like angels as superheroes almost. Um, So I I love the name. I want to talk about what inspired you to write it. What is your intention and what do you want people to get out of this book? Oh, beautiful. Um, So the, the funny thing is, is it's channeled. So I, it just came, it came through to me and it was as I would always sit down and um, write, like after my toddler went to bed, I'd sit down and write. And then I was noticing that the writing seemed to have some congruency, like there was chapters forming. So then I would Mm. change from my journal to the computer because I was like, oh, I think this is something. So the intention was just that I think there's a book coming through and I better get to work, right? Um, But then as the message of the book became more and more clear, the more I wrote, the more I started to understand why the book was coming through. Mm. And then I got really excited because <laughs> the book is, The Keepers of the Light Crows, it's, it's what we need at this time in humanity, right? Mm. So, like, I feel like with your amazing podcast and all the listeners who can understand what I'm saying, some people, what I'm saying will be a different language, Mm. but all your resonant listeners who get what I'm saying and feel what I'm saying as an energy, like we're energy beings. It's safe to say that there's been a fair bit of work done there to get to that point in consciousness of your Mm. listeners. Like they've been on the spiritual path, so to speak on a spiritual or healing journey And now here they are. It's 2022. And Mm. I'm pretty sure that most people on this journey have gone through an even more intense awakening of consciousness in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And now here they are like at this, this new level of perception, a new level of consciousness, seeing the world differently, understanding themselves a bit differently. So something's got to change. The idea of a spiritual path, spiritual journey of just working through linear time and slowly upgrading, slowly upgrading. We're, we're past that now as vibrational beings. And the book is here to tell us that we are ready to change our perspective of how we move through our spirituality, how we evolve our consciousness. And the perspective needs to change from evolving through linear time, the notion of a journey, spiritual journey, linear mm. time, to understanding that if all of creation exists now as we've discussed the infinite vibrations of all of existence exist now then as a vibrational being where are you going to direct your energy who are you 
it's a choice and that choice comes from your mind, your emotional body and how you choose to act and react with the world. Mm-hmm. So the keepers of the light codes, who are they? They are they're the light infused beings of all of existence. So it's safe to say that a lot of humanity is a keeper of the light codes mm-hmm. or, or is ready to be. And the book is the initiation into that. Mm. It's the a series of initiations that one by one dissolve any like attachments to the idea of the spiritual journey, dissolve any resistance to the idea that we are ascended whole and complete and um, initiate into a higher state of being where we are aligned to purpose and aligned to the um, pursuit of that purpose from a space of love above all else. Right. Right. That's beautiful. Yeah. I noticed the book was broken up into two sections, lessons and initiation. So readers will go through the lessons first, then tap into the initiations. And what was the thought process with breaking it up like that? And could you also shed more insight into what the lessons, why Mm. the lessons come before the initiations? Yeah. So after I channeled a few chapters, I I started to understand that I was writing a book so I asked spirit you know how does the book need to look how is it Mm. formatted and then it it was that there would be nine lessons and 28 initiations Mm. so then once I knew that I was like okay when I got to lesson eight I was like oh getting a bit excited because I knew I was nearly on to the initiation so I just followed that kind of instruction manual but the lessons are very simple the lessons are just just retweaking our perception of reality Mm -hmm. and a lot of the lessons like for probably a lot of your listeners it would be stuff that would be a reminder it's like yeah I know that I know that my heart is the gateway to truth Mm -hmm. I know that time isn't linear all these reminders but then it's like doesn't matter where you are on your journey sometimes you need the reminder And yeah, so the lessons are those reminders. And then the initiations are the step-by-step rewiring of your energy system. Mm. And within the initiations, there's 28 of them. Within them, there's practices and mantras and um, actionable steps to rewire and re-understand who we are as energetic beings. Mm. Because the earth has really changed the energy of the earth and the energy of the collective has really changed. We are, so many of us are very telepathic now. So many people channeling deeply intuitive, whether they think they are or not. So, you know, how does this group of of light beings on planet earth now need to approach their spirituality? It needs to change, you know, to start with, it was, going to more yoga, doing more meditation, all the stuff that we had to do to be here now. <laughs> yeah. And now we need to come at it differently to understand what well, if we're whole, if we're complete, if we're ascended, if we choose the vibration of who we are now, then how do we approach the day? How do we serve humanity if we are, are coming from a space of absolute wholeness? Mm. It completely changes life when you tap in and see the world from a different perspective of who you are. Mm. Yeah. Well, this is, this has been such a beautiful conversation, beautiful message, wonderful book. Um, Where can people find you if they want to learn more about the work that you do, if they want to get your book, where they can, where can they reach out? Sure. So come to my website, which is riannonhines.com, and you can find out more about my book, which launches on the 1st of October. And you can work with me in my intuitive rebirth energy work training. So right now I'm training practitioners in the certification where they can learn how to like take their sessions to a new level through channeling and working with multidimensional visualization, breath, vibration, shamanic instruments and sound. So that's the Intuitive Rebirth Practitioner training and my book. And you can go rhiannonhines.com or you can come over to my Instagram, which is rhiannonhines.